In my last video, when using Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator, we saw that my biological age was 12 years younger than my chronological. Similarly, using aging.ai, I was 20 years younger than my chronological age. So how am I doing it? Well, first in terms of supplements, and I'm, I've mentioned this in other videos, I've been taking levothyroxine, 137 and a half micrograms per day for more than 20 years as I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my 20s. Now, although I took it out for my last blood test, uh, I included methyl B12 for this blood test uh, once every three days, 1,000 micrograms, so about 300 micrograms per day with the goal of reducing my homocysteine, and that'll potentially be a topic for another video. What about average fitness stats? Now, note that this is from my last blood test on no November 1st through uh, my 12-12, the day before this uh, blood test number six. So that's a 42-day period, and these are my average stats over those that 42-day period. So I weigh myself every day. My average body weight was 155 pounds, so about 70 kilograms. Resting heart rate, RHR, 42, about 42 beats per minute, BPM. Heart rate variability, uh, HRV, about 50 milliseconds. Uh, so uh, those are cardiovascular health-related metrics. Now for the previous blood test, blood test number five in 2021, and that, for that period, it was from September 2nd through 10:31, October 31st of this year. Uh, my previous data there was 155.6 pounds for body weight, so a small decrease. And then resting heart rate was a little bit lower in the previous test, and heart rate variability was a little bit higher on that previous test. So for this test, those data actually went in the wrong directions. Now, because I have a 42-day period for this blood test and a 59-day period for the last blood test, I can compare those two groups of data using a uh, two-sample t-test, and then I can evaluate statistical significance. So these two groups of data are statistically significant, so I had a small but uh, statistically significant decrease in body weight, and then also small but sig uh, statistically significant uh, increases for resting heart rate and a reduction for heart rate variability. But note that these small alterations for body weight and cardiovascular health-related metrics weren't enough to affect biological age. As on my last test, for using Levine's test, it was about the same, so 37.1 years. And for aging.ai, the previous value was 30 years, whereas on this test, it was 29. So with that in mind, what about my diet? So here's my average dietary intake. And then again, is that 42-day period from the last blood test up until the day before this blood test. And this is my average daily intake in grams per day with the exception of green tea, which is in ounce, ounces. So that's uh, ranked number 24th. So it's ranked in terms of amount with the highest amount at the top and lowering you know, lesser amounts uh, as we go down the list. Now, I'm not going to go over why the, the foods at the top, top of the list are, uh, have that abundance. I've covered that in other videos. I'm going to focus on the foods that were um, different for this period versus the last and why I made those changes. So at number five, we can see mushrooms. And if you follow my uh, video series on quantifying biological age and my diet uh, breakdowns uh, that correspond to those biological ages, this will be the first time you've seen mushrooms. Now, I, I've had mushrooms in the, in the past, uh, just not uh, before I started this video series in 2020. So uh, 166 and a half uh, grams of mushrooms per day. And that amount of mushrooms gets uh, yields about 11.8 milligrams per day of spermidine. So why is spermidine important? And I have a video on this. If you're interested in that and missed it, it'll be in the right corner. So maybe you can check it out. So spermidine increases lifespan in mice. And that's what's shown here. Just as one example of the data for spermidine impacting uh, health and potentially lifespan. So when compared with the control fed animals in black, the spermidine fed animals in red, had a significant increase in median lifespan. So what about data in people? So in terms of all-cause mortality risk, that's what we're looking at here, or the cumulative incidence of death on the y-axis. And this is uh, when starting with a baseline spermidine intake and then 20 years afterwards, so a 20-year follow-up. And in that study, people that had a spermidine intake greater than 11.6 milligrams per day, they had the lowest all-cause mortality risk and then values lower than 11.6 uh, milligrams per day of spermidine had an increase, significantly, significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. So that's one reason why I shoot for at least 11.6 milligrams of, sper of spermidine per day, which just for mushrooms, I'm getting that. I'm getting that from other foods too, but I get at least that just for mushrooms. Now, other notable changes were uh, my cumulative intake of corn, oats, steel-cut oats, and barley. And when those three are combined, I, uh, my intake, my average daily intake was 154 grams per day. In comparison with the previous blood test, blood test number five in 2021, uh, it was only 32 grams per day and only from corn. Oats and barley were not in 
uh, were not in, in, the, in the diet composition that corresponded to blood test number five. So I 5x the intake of corn, oats, and barley cumulatively relative to the, uh, the, my last blood test. So the obvious question then, then is, why did I increase whole grain intake for this blood test? So to start to answer that, we, let's take a look at my glucose levels over the past six plus years since I started tracking both uh, my diet with uh, weighing, weighing all my food with a food scale, logging it into chronometer, and then putting that data into an Excel sheet. And then also in 2015, I started blood testing up to six times per year. So over that six plus year period, I have 32 blood tests. And as we can clearly see, my blood glucose levels have been increasing over that six and a half year period. And in fact, for the last 15 blood tests, my glucose levels have been greater than 90 milligrams per deciliter. Again, for 15 blood tests in a row, this is definitely going in the wrong direction because glucose increases during aging and higher levels, relatively higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So what may be impacting glucose? So to begin to uh, address that, I looked at correlations for my macronutrient intake that corresponds to each of these blood tests with glucose levels. And that's what's shown here. So the little r is the correlation coefficient, and then the p-value is uh, the measure of statistical significance with a value less than 0 0.05, indicating statistically a, some, the, value, the, the correlation being statistically significant. So let's start with what's not statistically significantly correlated with uh, glucose levels. And that's my total calorie intake as shown there, the p-value at 0 0.88. That's not a significant uh, correlation. Now, the strongest correlation for my uh, glucose levels is for total fat intake. The higher my total fat intake, that's significantly correlated with a higher glucose uh, level. And um, conversely, a higher average daily carbohydrate intake is significantly correlated with lower glucose. Now, they, that may, may seem paradoxical to some, but note that my carbohydrate intake is not from processed junk, which would be expected to raise fasting glucose. And in support of that idea, we can also see a significant inverse uh, correlation. So in other words, a relatively higher fiber intake is significantly correlated with lower glucose. So most of my carbohydrate intake comes from fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, and some legumes, and which those are fiber-rich foods, which may explain why carbohydrates, in my case, are significantly correlated with lower glucose. Now, note that it isn't just fat, a higher fat intake that's correlated with higher glucose, also protein intake, as shown there. Um, so for, the for my highest average daily protein intake that corresponds to, the, uh, uh, to a single blood test during this six plus year period was 147 grams per day. For this blood test though, I consumed less than that. So about 108 grams per day. So if I was consuming closer to 147, I would try to cut my protein intake with the goal of cutting glucose, you know, reducing my glucose levels. But uh, since I've already made that cut for protein, that, uh, that suggests that the emphasis should be on reducing my total fat intake. So let's look a little bit more into, into this total fat story and how it may be impacting my biomarkers, not just glucose. So my fat intake, my average daily uh, uh, total fat intake has been increasing since 2015 as shown there. So average daily fat intake on the y-axis plotted against time. And we can, the, the two plots, the plot for glucose on the left and the plot for fat intake, so each dot course is the fat intake that corresponds to a blood test on the left. They look virtually identical. So note that uh, this isn't accidental. As I mentioned, I've been tracking my diet uh, every day since 2015. So I've done this purposefully in order to have enough data at a low fit fat intake, at an intermediate fat intake, and at a high fat intake so that I can properly evaluate uh, whether, you know, what fat amount is optimal for me, at least based on glucose right now. I'm going to get a little bit more into that with the big picture biomarkers in a minute. Now, for the most recent blood test, as indicated by the green arrow, I cut my total fat intake from the last uh, blood test from 116 grams per day, which was close to my highest intake that I've had over the past six and a half years, to 94 grams per day. And correspondingly, glucose went down. Now, again, that's just a correlation. Correlation does not imply causation. But for the next blood test, I'm working on reducing my uh, total fat intake to in the 80 to 85 gram range, so at least another 10 gram cut. And if correlation does uh, there is some causation for total fat on glucose. In my case, we'd expect to see glucose levels drop and potentially too to somewhere in the 80s for the first time uh, in the past 16 tests. Now note that for uh, this to happen and for fat to be, fat to be implicated in uh, a potential uh, uh, you know, reduction in my glucose levels, uh, because my protein intake uh, is also correlated with higher glucose, I, I should keep that approximately the same as where it was for the last test at about 108 grams per day. And that's, that's the goal. So keep protein the same as the last test, reduce fat intake, and correspondingly increase carbohydrate intake, 
to follow the correlations. And that's one reason why increased intake of oats, barley, and, and corn, because those are mostly carbohydrate-rich foods. But note, if it, this is kind of a reductionist approach, only focusing on glucose. If I reduce total fat intake, will it improve glucose but make other biomarkers worse? So what's the correlative effect of total fat intake on the big picture biomarkers? And uh, so what are the big picture biomarkers? And if you've missed this data in previous videos, I'm just going to go through it relatively quickly. So the big picture biomarkers are 23 blood-based biomarkers uh, that uh, are indicative of uh, multiple organ systems and things like insulin sensitivity, like uh, fasting glucose. But also I've got a homocysteine on the list there as an index of, uh, a, you know, a rough index of methylation, three markers of kidney function, three markers of liver function, all the major lipoproteins, HDL, LDL, VLDL, lipoprotein A, all the major immune cells and including platelets, red blood cell related metrics, a, m a measure of inflammation, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and then the overall biological age score is indicated by Levine's PhenoAge and aging.ai. So note that if total fat intake is significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the right direction than the wrong direction, then a higher daily fat intake may be optimal for me. And note, this may not apply to everyone else, but we can all replicate this approach, uh, you know, looking at correlations between diet with biomarkers to, to get at the personalized approach that can potentially optimize health. So in terms of what's significantly correlated, there are 11 significant correlations with a p-value less than 0.05 for total fat intake with uh, these uh, 23 blood biomarkers. So again, 11 significant correlations for total fat with these big picture biomarkers. So then the next issue is to address whether these 11 biomarkers are going in the right direction or the wrong direction in terms of how they change during aging and their associations with all-cause mortality risk. So seven of these are relatively straightforward and I've presented um, pretty much all of these data in other videos. And if you're interested in that, just leave a comment and I'll direct you to where you can find uh, the aging and all-cause mortality data for these given biomarkers. So uh, a higher total fat intake is significantly correlated with seven biomarkers going the wrong direction, and that includes glucose, blood, blood urea, nitrogen, bun, VLDL, neutrophils, a lower lymphocyte percentage, higher monocytes, and higher platelets. So uh, right off the bat, we've got seven of the 11 going in the wrong direction. With a biomarker going in the right direction, a higher total fat intake is significantly correlated with a lower MCV. So lower MCV is found in youth, and a lower, relatively lower MCV is significantly associated with lower all-cause mortality risk, so that's going in the right direction. So then we've got three left, uh, aspartate uh, aminotransferase, AST, um, LDL, and red blood cells. Now, those I've, ta I've, I've tagged those as debatable based on the published literature, because if we go by just the published literature, having lower AST is uh, optimal based on all-cause mortality risk. And then conversely, higher red blood cells is uh, a good thing because they decline during aging and having lower amounts is also associated, associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. LDL is debatable. There are studies showing lower is better and higher is better. But when I do a biomarker versus a biomarker analysis, so AST versus all of these big picture biomarkers, in my data, actually relatively higher is better. And then conversely too, red blood cells, when I do biomarker versus biomarker analysis, Having lower red blood, red blood cells is actually significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the right direction than wrong. So that's why I put three of these in the debatable column. LDL follows a similar pattern. Uh, but for sure, we've got these seven that are going in the wrong direction, seven of the 11. So from that, I conclude that having a higher average daily fat intake is significantly correlated with more big picture biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. And note that beyond just the correlations with glucose, this explains why I reduced fat intake for this most recent blood test, and then correspondingly why I increased my carbohydrate uh, intake, uh, predominantly from corn, oats, and barley. So what does the rest of the diet look like? I've, re I've already shown um, my protein intake and the first 26 foods. What about the rest of the diet? So here's the macro and micronutri mac micronutrient composition that corresponds to blood test number six. So in terms of calorie intake, uh, 2373 calories per day. I've already shown the protein intake. Uh, in terms of total fat, we can see I averaged 94 grams per day. And if you're interested in the full breakdown in, ter in terms of MUFA, PUFA, saturated, uh, trans fatty acids, et cetera, that's there. And then in terms of carbohydrates, you can see all the full breakdown there, including fiber, uh, total fructose and sucrose, sucrose intake, and then net carbs after subtracting fiber from total, total carbohydrate intake. Uh, Full vitamin breakdown, full mineral breakdown, um, kind of doing a data dump here. I've discussed why I have higher than the RDA for many of these. If you're interested in why a certain um, macro or micronutrient is much higher than the RDA, just leave a comment and I'll uh, explain away. And then last but not least, uh, whereas I showed the first 26 foods, 
Here are the remaining lesser amounts of the remaining 26 foods. So 52 foods were consumed during this 42 day period and foods 27 to 52 are shown there. All right, that's all for now. Uh, if you're interested in more uh, about my biohacking attempts to uh, hack aging, check us out on Patreon. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.